Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Morphe Auction House, taking a look at a fantastically cool piece of American military history. This is a Colt Production Automatic Machine Rifle model of M1909, more commonly known as a Bene Merci. This is the first actual light machine gun adopted by the US military, and well, it didn't last long and it got a pretty poor reputation, but holy cow is it an impressive gun to take a look at. So uh, this was developed by the Hotchkiss Company, uh, two engineers there, or uh, the CEO of the company and one of his engineers, uh, Benet and Merci. And I should point out, the Hotchkiss Company was originally an American company. It was started by Benjamin Hotchkiss. By the time this gun was uh, being worked up, he was long dead. Uh, but the company remained in his, you know, kept his name for branding purposes. And the company was actually located in Paris. Uh, when Hotchkiss was originally developing guns, he had trouble selling them in America and found a much more fertile market in Europe, and so he located the company in France. At any rate, it was still there. Uh, and this was one of not a whole lot of light machine guns, reasonably reliable light machine guns, available before 1910. There were, of course, some others. There was the Madsen and, and a few others. But uh, this design was actually adopted by the French, the British, and the Americans. Now, in the case of the Americans, this was uh, basically a partner gun with the 1904 Maxim. And uh, there's, if you're interested in this, in the, the deeper history of this, I would recommend, recommend reading uh, the, the books by Julian Hatcher, because he was actually personally involved in this process. Basically, the US adopted the 1904 Maxim, and then when the Army went to actually train with it and develop doctrine and tactics for it, they realized yeah, there's really two kinds of machine guns, and you need them both. There's light machine guns and heavy machine guns. And uh, this went through the adoption process, and I'll be honest with you offhand, I don't know how this thing managed to get adopted, but it was the best option out there, apparently. And uh, they went ahead and adopted it and set it up as a companion gun. Now the problem was the machine gun uh, sections weren't really a focal point for training in the US military. Uh, the, well, machine gun platoons, I should say, uh, were often a dumping ground for problematic or underperforming uh, unit commanders. This was a, a problem endemic to a lot of armies, not just the United States. So, you know, this is, this is a gun that has a lot of quirks and really takes a lot of practice and training to become very proficient with. And the units that had them generally didn't get that kind of training, and they weren't the best troops. So it wasn't a great performer. Now, a couple things to, to take a look at on this. It almost all, well, all of them are set up with optics rails, and most of them actually were issued with optical sights, which is kind of cool and kind of ahead of its time for 1909. Um, this gun is chambered for 30 6 the standard US military cartridge. Uh, the British ones, of course, were in 303, the French ones were in 8 Lebel. This uses a 30 round feed strip. Uh, for feeding. Uh, fits up here in the top of the gun. The, these patterns, the, the light Hotchkiss guns feed with the, the feed strip facing upwards. The heavy Hotchkiss guns, which saw substantial use during World War I, those guys feed with the strips down. So uh, let's go ahead and, and look at some of the really wacky features of this thing. There's some stuff on here that's anachronistic. There's some stuff that'll make you go, why on earth did they do that? And just, if you're a machinist, this is a magnificent specimen to take a look at. All right, first off, I want to talk about the support mechanism, like how the gun's actually mounted, because we've got a bunch of different things going on here. First off, we've got this bipod, which is, I, I, I have to just say it, this is like the worst bipod ever. Um, the bipod will fold all the way out to here, although I'd be, I don't know, you know, it's, I don't know if the gun is actually intended to be shot with the bipod down this far, but there are stops on the bipod feet for it. And then the bipod does the same thing coming backwards all the way to there. It's like, I don't know that I want to leave the weight on it down there. Up here, it swivels, it pivots only a little bit, um, but it's really difficult to get this thing to, you can't just stand it up on the bipod because the bipod will flop forward or flop back very easily. However, what you can do, which is what we've done here, is you can actually extend this really sophisticated, or at least really complicated, rear monopod. It's a two-foot monopod that comes out, and this 
provides enough friction basically to keep the gun upright. It then also allows you to let me take that out, adjust elevation of the gun. There we go. You can screw adjust elevation of the gun like so, up and down. And then if you, well, I'll show you this up close. And then lastly, we have this thing which clamps around the, the back of the barrel up here and the receiver back here. And this is a tripod adapter for a US pattern of Vickers tripod. So you can actually set this thing up on a really good tripod. Um, these are, by the way, really scarce pieces to find. So the way this rear monopod works, it's got two feet here, and they're just on this bar, and they can slide side to side, which allows you to traverse the gun while it's set on this monopod assembly. We have a screw dial here, which allows me to raise and lower the monopod incrementally. And then I can also pull back on this little handle, which unlocks the screw thread. I can either pull it entirely out, or simply quick adjust it like that, then let that drop back into place, and then I can go back to using this for my additional adjustment right there. If I want to lock this in place completely, I can then flip that trigger all the way in. That engages this lock, which means I can no longer push this back. So once you've got your elevation set, you lock that so that it, you don't inadvertently drop it. Now, in order to stow this, if you don't want to use it, we're going to dial this all the way down, lock it in right there, and then we're going to drop this all the way down. And then we have a little latch right here. This little hook on the back of the bipod, which by the way they have on both ends, so it's interchangeable, that snaps into this little hole in the back of the pistol grip, and that locks this whole thing. So when you're not using it, this is locked in place right there. Now another note about the design of this thing, you'll notice it has like the weirdest design of stock you've ever seen. You're actually supposed to put your face right here, which lines up with the sights right up here. This is your selector switch and your charging handle. So down like that is safe. This, let's see, yeah, that's safe. This is automatic. The next position is R, which is repetition or semi-automatic. Note that this handle doesn't go anywhere when you do that. And then all the way over, or all the way up there, is cycling the gun. So in this position we can actually pull the handle back. The bolt's already cocked, which is why there's no spring tension on this. This is like your original AR-style non-reciprocating charging handle. So we can lock that in. Safe. Semi. Pull. The sight on here is really quite elaborate. Uh, first off, it does flip up like so for use out to 2800 yards using this adjustable dial, or adjustable slide. Uh, you do have a notch sight back here for basically your battle sight use. And then for actual combat use you've got a choice of a rear notch there, or HK style, any one of these increasingly large apertures. And these are uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and 0 0.04, 0 06, 0 08, and 0 0.1 inches. Also note that this sight actually uh, shifts over to the left as you increase the range. That is not particularly uncommon in guns of this vintage, and that's done to, ac to um, account for bullet drift at long range due to the bullet spinning in one direction as opposed to the other. As you saw at the beginning, these are also equipped with rails. Uh, for Warner and Swayze telescopic musket sights. Both the 1908 and the 1913 patterns will fit. This particular one has a model of 1913 Warner and Swayze. That's a six power optic, and it is prismatic, so you look in here and you look out a little higher up. Um, these things have all sorts of super cool plates and data and compensation adjustments and all sorts of crazy stuff on here. Um, I have a separate video where I talk in, in a little more detail about these Warner and Swayze optics, so if you're curious about them, uh, check out that video for a little more detail. Uh, these were offset to the side, allegedly to avoid the problem of heat mirage coming off the guns. Um, possibly also just because there's so much other stuff on the top of the 
the Hotchkiss design that uh, there's not a good place to put a scope up there. The front sight is just a, a narrow square post with a very substantial long hood over it. And together with that really tiny rear notch sight, this presents a very challenging sight picture. Uh, I would say very similar to the 1903 uh, sight picture. This would be great for a target rifle. This will give the US a, a little bit of a benefit of the doubt here because they really hadn't done, hadn't had the time and combat experience to learn proper light machine gun tactics. This is not a good light machine gun sight. Oh, and by the way, this dial right here is your windage adjustment for that rear sight. So your elevation is this slider, and your windage is twisting the whole sight around on a pivot. These light pattern Hotchkiss guns, like the Benet Merci, do have quick change barrels on them. Uh, interesting to note that the Colt production ones have this really, uh, really deep knurling uh, on the front of the barrel. That's something that could have been there for grip, but maybe um, you know, you'd be using some sort of insulating cloth when you grab the barrel on that if it's really hot. Could also be an attempt to get extra surface area for better cooling. Uh, whatever the reason, the Springfield Armory produced guns don't have that knurling. That was a, a Colt only thing. And speaking of Colt, here are the markings on the side. Automatic machine rifle, caliber 30, model of 1909, made by the Colt Patent Firearms Company. This one is serial number 228. We don't know exactly how many were made, uh, but all the ones that are known have three-digit serial numbers, which means when you combine the Colt production and the Springfield production, it's a, a, an absolute top-end possible total of 2,000 guns, probably more like 1,000 to 1,500, somewhere in that range. So really, by, by a modern standard, not very many of these guns being made, and uh, very few of them survive to this day. So when it comes to overall use, there's still some mystery to it. Um, we don't have good production numbers, or at least I have not been able to find good production and purchase numbers on these guns. What we do know is they were purchased by both the US Army and the US Navy. Uh, the initial purchase from Hotchkiss was only 29 guns. However, uh, the, the military also managed to negotiate a licensed production deal, and these were produced by both Springfield, Armory, and Colt. You can tell them apart fairly easily because the Springfield guns have a knurled barrel up here for cooling. I'm sorry, the Colt guns have a knurled barrel. The Springfield guns have a smooth barrel. Uh, at the time of uh, the US entry into World War I, this was the most common or the most numerous machine gun in US service. And the US military had 670 of these uh, on its inventory books. Some of them were shipped to France, but they were all used for training only. They weren't actually taken into combat. US troops uh, would carry mostly French machine guns until the very, very end of the war, when we started getting BARs and Colt 1917s into service. Uh, most of the American machine gunners would be using Hotchkiss 1914 heavy machine guns and Shosha 1915 automatic rifles. The Shosha, by the way, being basically the, the functional or the, the tactical equivalent of the, the 1909 here, the, the light machine gun. You saw they called this the aut an automatic machine rifle, before the people had really figured out the tactics and the nomenclature behind squad automatic weapons, light machine guns, that sort of thing, how best to use them, and, and what name was actually appropriate for them. So uh, didn't really see any use in, in World War I. They were declared obsolete in 1918 and replaced with the BAR. The one place where these guns saw notable use is the raid on Columbus, New Mexico. And this was in 1916, in March of 1916. Uh, Pancho Villa raided into Columbus, New Mexico with this cunning plan to, uh, to start a war between the US and Mexico because his political rival had been put, well, had, had gained power in Mexico. And Villa wanted to get him kicked out of power and figured, well, if the US goes to war with Mexico, They'll take care of that, and then I can end up in charge instead. Well, it totally backfired on them. The US ended up going after Pancho Villa, not declaring war on Mexico. But uh, this, the, the main galvanizing incident of, of this was Villa's raid on the town of Columbus, New Mexico, which was intended quite seriously, quite literally, just to cause mayhem. Kill people, burn down stuff and get the US angry, and it certainly did that. However, Villa underestimated the number of American troops who were actually in the town. There were about 300 American troops there, uh, many of them, uh, well, active service, you know, these weren't guys on r, &R. this was an active military contingent. And 
uh, Via's men got came into the town between like 3.30 and 4 in the morning, uh, a couple thousand Vistas on horseback. And the, the US troops were taken by surprise. Uh, interestingly, they had to break down the doors to their own armory, because I guess they couldn't find the guy who had the keys, uh, to break out their own guns. They did have one machine gun platoon with four Bene Merci 1909 automatic machine rifles. And the popular legend of this is that the result of this battle was they became known as the Daylight Gun, because this raid happened before dawn in the morning, and allegedly these guns had all sorts of problems, and they malfunctioned constantly, and they couldn't figure out how to feed them. And The reality of this is not quite the same. Um, there certainly were some issues with the guns, especially at first, um, which are we can probably pretty well uh, attribute to the fact that A, it was pitch dark outside, there was no mo moonlight that night, uh, and B, US machine gun training was pretty lackluster at the time. However, once the guns got up and running, and more importantly, once there was light available to actually identify targets, uh, first it was light from a, a burning hotel, and later on of course the sun started to come up, uh, the US troops put down a substantial and very effective fire. The, the four uh, 1909 Bene Mercis fired a total of about 20,000 rounds, and that's not a pathetic, horrible, you know, non-functional machine gun. That's something that that may require some some skill to operate. But these guns could and did run. So you can't put 5,000 rounds through each one of those guns in a single morning if they're constantly breaking parts and 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 malfunctioning. So um, the gun's not quite as bad as in. in let me put it this way, if you put it in context, in 1909 it's not nearly as bad as people see it today. And it certainly is a really interesting historical piece, being the first American light machine gun, not just adopted by the US military, but actually manufactured here in the US, this particular one by Colt. Uh, and this particular gun comes with a bunch of accessories, including man, that really cool tripod adapter, which is a pretty darn scarce thing to find, as well as an entire box of 30-06 the name RC feed strips, which are also uh, quite a bit scarcer than you might expect. So if you're interested in having a gun like this in your own collection, it is coming up for sale here at Morphe's. Take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com. From there uh, you can uh, follow a link over to Morphe's auction catalog, take a look at their pictures, description, all the accessories that come with the gun, and um, decide if it's something that you'd like to have yourself. This is of course a fully transferable fully registered legal uh, NFA machine gun here in the US, and it is a curio and relic gun as well for that little extra, that extra bit of detail for folks uh, who appreciate it. Thanks for watching.